I got one of those uh, emails that go around. In fact, I received a number of them. One said that on Wednesday, October 29th, 2008, on the anniversary of the 29th of October, 1929, there's going to be a collapse in the stock markets around the world. Well, here we are. Other prophecies supposedly have announced that we are going to experience some tough times and hardships. Well, it took me a few seconds to kind of reflect on all of these emails and on the words that are said, and then really within seconds I began to pray, and I said, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, whether these people are right or wrong, it doesn't matter whether uh, these prophecies are true or not, or whether uh, these prophecies are of God or not, whether these uh, predictions come to pass or not. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. You say, why? Because whether things are going to get tough or not, it doesn't matter. Because when things get tough, tough people go to the Word of God. Amen. Here is the fact. There is nothing that we have experienced or will experience that we do not have an answer for in the Word of God. There is nothing that you have in your life individually or nationally or globally that we go through that does not have an answer in the Word of God. What do we do in times of crisis? What do God's people do in times of crisis, whether they are personal crisis, national crisis, global crisis, whatever kind of crisis they may be? We have experienced them in the past. We're going to experience them in the future. But the question is, how do you handle them? And the prophet Joel, speaking to the nation at that time, at that period of history, a nation that was devastated economically. He's actually talking about locusts. And he says they lack an army. They came and invaded the land, and they devastated the land economically ever since they became a nation. Locusts have descended upon the land and devoured every green thing in the land, from plants to trees. And that's what he's talking about here in Joel chapter 2. It's an economic devastation. He's talking about the army that was invading the nation, the army of locusts. And listen, for an agrarian society that is totally dependent on vegetation, that is total devastation. There was not just a little bit of devastation. There was a total devastation. In fact, in recent history, we know that back in 1915, there was such a devastation by locusts that came into the land of Israel and Syria that literally devoured every green thing in the land and was a complete devastation, and they were utterly dependent on food from outside. It started in March of 1915, and that devastation went on until the month of June. And so for four months period, the land literally was stripped bare of every green thing, vine, fig leaves, and grains, and grass. Similar thing to what was happening in the days of Joel. And so Joel is called by God as a prophet of God to speak about this time of devastation, to tell his people, to speak God's word to God's people in order to tell them what to do in times of crisis, in times of economic devastation. Let us learn from it because there are so many people who do not know how to handle crisis in their life. The prophet Joel here tells us some incredible lessons that each of us must learn how to handle crisis in our lives. But the first thing you notice about Joel's message, I mean, he is saying something that would be an absolute anathema to us in the 21st century, and I'm going to explain to you how. Because in times of crisis, none of us want somebody to tell us that it's going to get worse. <laughs> and that's what he's doing here. 
Because you would think that in times of crisis, in the times of pain, you want somebody who will say to you, oh, there, 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 don't worry your pretty little head. Right? You want somebody to say, hey, it's going to get better. It's bound to get better. Just, just look up. After all, every cloud has a silver lining. Be happy. Don't worry. All you have to do is your name and claim prosperity, and it will be yours. Isn't that what we're supposed to do in times of crisis? And yet, Joel goes in the opposite direction <laughs> to what everything we would expect, everything that we would want. He goes in the opposite direction, and he says, I know that your economic devastation is bad. I know that you have lost a large percentage of your portfolio. I know that you've lost a great deal of your retirement money. Listen, my colleague told me when I got back from England, he said, hey, our retirement money was devastated. I said, praise the Lord. I'm never going to retire. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to drop that preaching. Somebody says, drop that. <laughs> He's saying, I know your 401k has gone through the floor, but this is nothing in comparison of the day of judgment that is coming upon the world. I'm, I must confess, I wanted to say to him, Joel, baby, <laughs> give me a break. This is not the time to speak of the coming future judgment. This is not the time for negative preaching. This is not a time of doom and gloom. And Joel would say, Listen to me. This is, I'm giving you what God said. I'm not giving you my ideas and my opinions. I, I'm not here to just pat you on the back and give you some sob. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to tell you what God said. And he say, would be saying to us, Look, listen, if you think that a little bit of economic hiccup has got you all bent out of shape and bamboozled, what will you do when the real deal comes about? How will you handle the big one? How are you going to be prepared for the day of judgment? Now, thankfully, he does not leave us high and dry, but he tells us exactly what to do in tough times. He tells us what God wants us to do in tough times. He's telling us what to do in times of crisis. And Joel wants us to know that every crisis whether it's in our lives individually, in our family, or in a national level, or in a global level, every crisis ought to be a dress rehearsal for the day to come, for the big one. <laughs> that every crisis that we face must be a reminder for every one of us that the big day of judgment is coming. You know, as many of you know, my family and I lived in Southern California back in the 70s. And the first thing the housing department in the, on campus did as they walked us through the, the apartment, they said, you know, here you can't have bookshelves above certain height and can't have heavy things hanging on the wall. And they went through the thing. And then finally said, you know, you need to understand. Every time there's a trimmer, it should be a reminder that the big one is coming. And that's exactly what the prophet Joel is saying here. He is saying, don't waste these dress rehearsals. Don't waste God's warning signs. Don't waste these alarm bells that God sent our way. But the problem is, and I know and you know, that we have such a short attention span. We live on perishable news. It comes in and 24 hours later, it's gone. Something else happened. We have short attention. We forget our lessons very quickly. Oh, but Joel is saying, find out what God is saying to you during hard times, during times of crisis, during times of difficulty. Find out what God is teaching you during these difficult crisis, challenging times. Let them be a reminder for every one of us that the day is coming when God is going to shake everything that's to be shaken. Prepare yourself for the big one. How? Two ways. First, he said, tear out the idols out of your life, but not your hair. <laughs> Secondly, he said, lead others to worship and don't fret and panic like them. Lead them into worship the living God. Tear away the idols and not your hair. 
You know, most people, when we face a crisis, when we face a difficult time, we say, well, man, he's tearing his hair out. You know, in Israel, there was a tradition, there was a practice that when a person is in mourning or going through a tough time or a crisis, something so severe, he will literally rip his clothes, and as he rips this, the, the, the garment, as the fabric gets torn apart, it's an indication of the life that is being ripped apart. But like all traditions, what happened, some would go through the motions without inner transformation. Uh, outer symbols gave way to the real meaning. Uh, they kept the tradition but lost the meaning. They went through the outward appearances, but they did not change. Their hearts were not changed. And listen, please, it is much easier to go through the outward emotions and the outward motions when you're going through a tough time. It's easier to just do whatever it takes to get out of a crisis. Uh, even atheists pray in a foxhole. In fact, it was said of Voltaire, the famous French atheist in, of the 1700s, it was said of him that he prayed to God once <laughs> when he was caught in a blizzard as he was traveling in the Alps. And that is why Joel said, in times of crisis, it is your heart that needs radical change, not your circumstances. It is your heart that needs transformation, not the economy. It is your heart that needs to complete surgery and not your situation. Listen to what he said, verses 12 and 13 of chapter 2. Even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all of your heart, with, with, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Question, what is this rending of the heart? What is this repentance that he's talking about? Well, it is the acknowledging and the confessing and the forsaking of idols that has crept into our lives and replaced the Lord Jesus Christ. These idols that have disowned God from His rightful place in my life and in your life. That's what he's talking about. Believers, please listen to me. Acknowledging and confessing, and we desperately need to do that, that we have placed our hopes on money and possessions. Tear it out. He, we, have, we have placed our hopes on credit cards and borrowing and getting into debt and monies that we cannot pay back. We are more concerned about our status symbols than we about the glory of God. We think if we got money that we are important. If we don't have money, we're not important. We have spent more time in front of the television than in the Word of God. We get more excited about sports than on the God, by the gospel. Materialism and not ministry become the object of our affection. Worship is something we do when it is convenient, not the joy of our lives. Prayer is only something we do when we need something from God. Acknowledge, confess, forsake. That is the cry of God to the heart of everyone who is listening to me, whether you're watching, whether you're here in this place. It is astounding to me sometimes. When I see the younger generation, they want in their 20s and 30s what their parents have not only gotten when they're in their 50s and their 60s. They want it all now, and they want it immediately. Kids are so plugged into cell phones and computers and, and television in their rooms, not the Word of God. I hear about some kids, as soon as they turn 16, they want the latest model car. Our expectation, beloved friends, have gone beyond reason. And we need to tear these idols out of our lives. We need to cease from placing importance on materialism and accumulation, but rather on sacrificing. And give. Can you believe people in this country cannot sacrifice one hour to go and vote, and then they complain when we have godless politicians? Please. No wonder people are panicking and fearful. No wonder. Idols are piling up in our lives, and we need to tear them away. As I began 
to sense the Spirit of God leading me to this passage to bring it to you. I began to think the question that kept plaguing me, where did Jesus pray until he was sweating blood? Where was he? No, he was not in Pontius Pilate's Hall of Justice, was not on his way to the cross. No, it was not during the trial, but it was back yonder in Gethsemane, in the garden. In fact, the book of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 said, There he offered prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who's able to save him. Now, if you and I were there during that dreadful hour, if you and I were there during that hour of agony in his prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane, probably would have thought, wow, if he's getting all cut up like this, if he's getting all broken up like this here, what is he going to do when he goes to the cross? If he is all churned up and sweating blood, what is he going to do on his road to Golgotha? What will he do during the trial? Why didn't he just approach things like, hey, let's wait and see? Why didn't he just get some sleep like the other three friends, the other three disciples? But listen, here's the fact. At the time of the cross, Jesus walked to the cross with courage and with confidence, with trust in his heavenly Father, and he walked there while the other three fell apart and ran away. Why? He was prayed up. He was prayed up. He was prayed up. Listen to me. A lifestyle of repentance, an idol tearing away, will make you face any crisis, whether it be personal crisis, national crisis, global crisis. A lifestyle of repentance will, not, will cause you not to fear anything, any challenge, any circumstance. In fact, a repentant lifestyle will make you welcoming whatever comes your way because you know that your day of salvation is drawing nigh. Joel is saying, somewhere in the economy of the sovereignty of God, he decreed that he responds to genuine cries, that he responds to genuine repentance, that God loves to stay his judgment, that God is looking for a good excuse to delay his judgment, that God longs to have mercy, that God longs to halt devastation, that God longs to halt the natural consequences of the rejection of God. He wants to see his children genuinely cry to him, not in cheap repentance, but in permanent change, in permanent repentance lifestyle. It is part of his sovereign will that he responds to the cries of his children. In times of crisis, tear away the idols in your life and in my life, not our hair. Secondly, leading others, leading others into worship of the living God, not fret and panic like them. And if you read those verses, verses 15, 16, and 17 of Joel chapter 2, and say, well, this is a call upon church leaders uh, to, re to call people to repentance, repent themselves and call others to repentance. And if you thought so, you're right. A leadership that does not lead by example is not worthy of the name. But in the light of the New Testament teaching that every believer in Jesus Christ is a priest, that we are a kingdom of priests, that we all have equal access to the Father, the priesthood of all believers is the very teaching of the New Testament. And in the light of New Testament teaching, it means that these verses are for every one of you. It's for every one of us. These words are directed to you and you and you and you and you. Moms and dads, they are directed to you. Sunday school teachers, small group leaders, everyone here in this place. And he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, declare the holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let 
the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chambers. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Don't make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? There was a Jewish tradition also for the priest to blow the trumpet or the chauffeur. I was trying to find one from some of my Messianic Jewish friends, but I couldn't get it in time. I, I wanted to show you what it's like, the chauffeur, to blow it. They would blow that in, in special days of calling the, the assembly together in order to gather in humility and in consecration and in prayer and in fasting before the Lord. Now, beloved, listen to me. If God is saying anything to us today, He is saying, believers, in every area of your responsibilities, sound the alarm. Remind people of the shortness of time before the judgment comes. Don't get sucked in by the soft proclamation of the gospel. Don't fall in the trap of smooth talking, of positive thinking preaching, because that smooth talking never prepare anybody. That smooth talking never adequately forewarn them of the coming judgment of that dreadful day. Parents, call your children for a time of prayer and rededication. Parents, teach your children to repent of their sins. Let them see you in your state of repentance. Let them watch you in solemn assembly. Believers everywhere, this is a serious time. This is an important time. And this ought to be a reminder of every one of us of the judgment of God. And therefore, I call upon every one of you to come and call God for mercy. Come and ask for mercy. The economy may go up or down. The unemployment may go up or down. The political wind may shift back and forth. But the one thing you can be absolutely sure of, the one thing that you can, you can absolutely be certain about is that God responds to the genuine cries of His people. Throughout the Scripture, God has proved it, not just in Joel, everywhere in the Scripture, over and over and over again, God responds to the cries of His people. In fact, in the book of Hosea, God so vividly reveals His heart. And when Hosea married a woman who kept running after other men and not responding to the love of her husband and kept running after other men, God said to Hosea, Hosea, that's me. That's how I feel. That's how I feel. That's how I feel when my children forsake me and place their affection and their time and their money and their energy on other things. That's how I feel. But I'm conscious of the fact that this message could be premature to some of you. There may be someone here today who have never experienced Jesus as the Savior of his or her life, never acknowledged their sin, and that the cross and the cross alone and through Christ alone, you can make it to heaven. You need to start at first base. You need to cry to the Lord today, Father, say, I repent. Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be the Savior the sole and only Savior of my life. I want you to be the Lord and the sole Lord of my life. That's where you begin. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness.
If you have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet 